The previous foreign invasion brought Sufia a fifth grade education that she is proud of in a village of largely illiterate women, but only by default because her family fled to Iran as refugees after Soviet troops abducted her father, enabling her to go to school there. Although some men say they want to educate their daughters, there is no broad push for a girl's school. Old codes that tie men's sense of family pride to the seclusion of their women seem more powerful for some than any drive for education. People were not interested to send their girls for education, and now is the same, said Abdul Rahim Mutmian, a grocer. We have to see the overall situation, it's not just about me. We are looking for other people to bring their girls to school, then we will get ready to bring ours. The women are still hopeful that change could come through aid. If they spent 5 to 10 percent of the money from the war on schools and hospitals, it would have transformed things said Sufia, who says she would now welcome the West if it would work with the Taliban. They brought helicopters and planes to attack us, now they should bring bulldozers to help build the road. Like the majority of Musa Kala residents The Guardian interviewed, Bibi Nima, a great-grandmother in her 60s, had no interaction with the Western mission beyond its bullets and bombs. She counted off losses from them including two cousins, three nephews, an uncle and a brother-in-law. Every day we looked out for the jets and drones patrolling here, and now we sleep at night and wake early in the morning without even hearing the sound of planes. The crumpled remains of a car, reduced to the snarled metal of its frame, still lies by the road where it was hit in the last aerial attack on her village of Gondai. That was two years ago, but the skies never cleared, and fear hung over residents while the jets and drones did. Musa Kala was among the most heavily contested parts of Afghanistan, and even after the ground war stopped and the first foreign then Afghan troops retreated from its bases, the air war continued. In 2006, when British forces brokered the uneasy first ceasefire with the Taliban and were evacuated in cattle trucks, the then Defense Secretary, Day Brown, called it iconic. But he had not endured the long, bumpy drive to a place with no roads, key to opium trading, but not on any other economic arteries. Once Western and Afghan government forces had been driven out, the Taliban gathered there and foreign fighters were able to pass through, Jackson said, though the details of their militant links are still unclear. The Pentagon claimed Islamic State, IS, and Al-Qaeda were based there. Civilians were regularly killed in airstrikes, but their deaths were difficult to verify, frequently denied by Afghan and American forces, and rarely made news unless the scale of the atrocity was so appalling, it could cut through the daily backdrop of bloodshed and war. Their fate is a bleak warning of potential deaths to come in an over-the-horizon drone war that the US and UK have pledged will continue against international terrorists in Afghanistan. The Pentagon claimed that the last US strike in Kabul, after the bloody airport bombing, was a righteous strike on a known terrorist to prevent another imminent atrocity. Instead, US media research shows it killed a much-loved aid worker with US ties and his family, their final hours exhaustively documented on security footage.